Okay, so hi again, everybody. So <laughs> this is the last lecture for today, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have Simo Sarka here. So Simo is from the Aalto University uh, in Finland, and he's going to talk about different perspectives from uh, to Gaussian process than the one he has seen before, more from the state space point of view. So thank you for coming. Yes, okay, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. And uh, indeed, um, I'm going to discuss about the uh, point of view of Gaussian processes as, uh, as a solutions to stochastic differential equations and also solutions to stochastic partial differential equations. That's a point of view which is very common in signal processing. So there where you see, when you see a Gaussian process, it means some kind of signal model, which is kind of a path-based process. And typically, they can be expressed as, as solutions to differential equations with random inputs. So let's start with the basic ideas and also do some calculations. And we'll derive a connection between the Ernst and Ulenbeck covariance function and the path space representation. And then we will take a look at more general, well, stochastic differential equations and the Gaussian processes, the connections there. And then we'll look at the, some connections between stochastic partial differential equations and Gaussian processes. The difference here is that uh, when we have a differential equation, it's, it's somehow like uh, you can always think that there's a time where that differential equation evol evolves. But in the case of partial differential equations, you don't have that kind of interpretation. And then conclusion and some things that you can actually do with this kind of point of view. So let's start with the basic ideas. And uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. But of course, you can also save them to end. But uh, it might be good to ask at the spot. So I will reveal all my cards on, in the first slide. But we, we can come back to this later when we see what this actually means. So the connections which I'm going to introduce is that so if we have a spatial covariance function, so you see so covariance functions, I hope, at least in this notation, in some of the lectures already, so it's a function of two two inputs or two spatial locations, however you want to interpret that. And then it turns out that when you have a Gaussian process with that type of, co type of covariant function, it somehow corresponds to your stochastic party artificial equations where you put in white noise and then you have a linear operator applying there. And you can kind of construct any Gaussian process by that kind of construction. So if you just select a linear operator, there suitably. So you, you can think this as a physical system. This might be a Laplacian operator, which corresponds to some kind of electro electrical field equation. And then the short density could be white noise. And it turns out that the covariance function of the field might actually match the one covariance function which you are looking into. So that's one connection. And then in temporal case, actually comes uh, even more interesting thing. So this, uh, it's not a partial differential equation, but quite concrete linear stochastic differential equation. Mm -hmm. So if you have some kind of temporal covariance function, there's almost direct mapping to differential equations where you put in white noise. So this w, small w, is always white noise in my slides. So this, uh, this is a spatial white noise. This is a temporal white noise. So if you actually start from some start from some t0 and you kind of solve this equation for each random realization of the white noise, you will get draws from the Gaussian process with this temporal covariance function. So we will take a look at a couple of examples how you actually can map between these two representations. And then there's something between. So maybe we might have a temporal part and the spatial part. Then uh, one, uh, well, it's actually a special case of this, this case, because you can always relabel one of the x's as t. It's just a change of name of the variable. But anyway, in that case, you typically can have this kind of more explicit representation. So this is a temporal process. But now we have some spatial variables here as well. And this is some kind of operator, which is kind of spreading the random function. And then we have a space-time white noise here. And uh, the point 
in these uh, connections is that you have specific methods, for example, for this type of models. So there are something called Kalman filters and uh, Bayesian filters and smoothers. So you can use them to solve GP regression problems with certain kinds of temporal covariance functions. And same actually works here. And for these kind of systems, you have many kinds of uh, party division equation solvers, which have existed longer than GPs, so there are some tricks which haven't all been used in the context of GPs. So the sparseness of the solutions and that kind of things. And of course, you could maybe transfer things to the other direction. So maybe we have learned in GP world something that the party division equation solvers don't really get advantage of yet. OK, so, so why, why would we want to go to this kind of route? Is that uh, in GPs, as you might have heard already during these couple of days, is that the computational complexity of, of the basic GP regression scales as n to the third by n is the number of measurements. So it means that uh, when you increase n, at some point you will hit the computational barrier. So in the, in the case of uh, using partial division equation or ODE solvers, SDE solvers, so for example, the Kalman filters are already ON in the number of, uh, of uh, measurements. So there's a huge improvement in the computational complexity. But of course, they only work for that specific kind of models. But anyway, where they do work, that's that's very good advantage. And then there are certain sparse approximations for PDEs, which are partly used also for GPs nowadays. But anyway, there are some tricks that might not be used always. And then uh, reduced rank methods or Fourier basis methods corresponds to some kind of uh, well, reduced rank methods also in GP regression. And then one interesting thing is that, OK, so we are discussing Gaussian processes. But of course, Gaussian systems such as the zero measure set among all the processes, right? So certainly, we, we have a path to non-Gaussian processes here as well. And downsides, they are quite inherently some kind of approximations, but because we, might, we need to enforce some kind of Markovian anti or have these conversations. So of course, that like at the full GP solution is the only one which is going to be exact in, the, in, the, in that sense. But anyway, so these might still be useful approximations in practice. So you can even guarantee some properties of them. And um, mathematics can become messy. But it's also classical mathematics. So in, in a certain sense, they have been solved already. OK, so let's take a look at a um, practical example, actually. So you might have seen this kind of uh, covariance function already. So there's this, uh, I call it Orstein Urenbeck process covariance function, but sometimes it's called exponential covariance function, maybe. So it has zero mean, and then the, the covariance between two points is uh, it's the <coughs> distance between the points times minus lambda, where lambda is some kind of a, a positive constant, and then it's in the exponent. So I'm, I'm now assuming that x is one dimensional to get the connection to orstein ulenbeck process. So it turns out that this representation is equivalent to this stochastic Diffusion equation, where this white noise process has a, OK, that's something called spectral density, which I, you know, that's Q. And the connection is basically that this needs to be equal to Q over 2 lambda. We will see that in a moment. And uh, now I used x here and relabeled that x as t. Of course, I could have x here, but it's just more natural to think that the uh, variable to be the time instead of just the arbitrary x there. Show why that's the case, or is that? Yes, so we will see the connection in a sense. I'm, I'm trying to use that to actually, <laughs> so we can jointly derive. And uh, also, this Orstein Ulbeck process, Markov process, we will also discuss that a bit, but yes, let's try to use the whiteboard. And try to use my electronic whiteboard. Let's see how, how this, how you can see it. 
Okay, so that works still. Okay. I hope that you can see it just fine. So what we had is, well, we have a differential equation of this type. Let me know if you don't see the writing. It's actually quite, I have quite bad writing, but I'll try to fix it in a moment. <laughs> so this was W, which is the white noise. OK, so what can we do with this kind of equation? Well, we want to solve it, so how, how would you proceed? You discretize it, right? <laughs> well, that's one way, yes, but uh, I don't want that. You mean classically? That yes, the transform-based methods. What, what do you mean? Oh, you take the Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. Yes, so Fourier transform would be, would be good. So I'm denoting the Fourier transform like this. So what happens to derivative in Fourier transform? Well, it, it becomes I or omega, right? And then I have a the Fourier transform and the Fourier transform of a white noise. That's that's less classical. Let, let's forget that it, it's not <laughs> L2 <laughs> integrable function. But anyway, so what I can now do is that uh, I can now solve for the Fourier transform of F, right? So what do I get? F transform. I change the lambda f to the left hand side and one over something, right? So it would be white noise, then i omega. You need to recall that my white noise is different. From, so this is omega, what's below here. Omega, let's make it that, like this. OK? And then I can compute something called the spectral density. There's a, the definition of the spectral density, it's, it's the absolute square of the process, the expected value of that, right? So the spectral density is going to be, well, what? Yes, it's like a conjugate times the function itself. And uh, let's take a shortcut. So it's going to be expected value of the transform of the white noise, like this. Mm. And then I will have a omega squared, lambda squared. And well, the definition of the white noise is that it has a constant spectral density, because the spectrum is flat. And I'm using Q for that. So the spectral density has this kind of form. OK. So how do I get the covariance function from the spectral density? Very elementary question. It's called wiener kinchin theorem, maybe. Fourier transform again. Or inverse Fourier transform, right? Yeah. Yes. So the spectral density is the Fourier transform of the covariance function and the other way around. So what we'll now do is that the covariance function, as function of my tau, the tau is t minus t prime, is going to be this kind of nice integral lambda squared e power to i omega and 1 over 2 pi, actually. So how do we do yeah, this? Well. Did I miss a variable? Oh. Ah, good point. Tau. Uh, yes, it should be omega. Tau t over. OK? Yes, so this is a bit tricky integral, but you might have seen on your courses in mathematics. It's, I can give a hint how you basically do that. If you go to web page, oh, just a second. Well, one way is to, it's the same which you can find from the page on residue theorem. <laughs> so it's a bit awful, but you can also find it in the Fourier transform tables, so which is nice. <laughs> sure. So someone has used the residue, th residue theorem for us already. So somewhere here, 
are the tables. So it's actually here. Can you see? So it tells that the I lost. So here, so it should be e power to minus a tau. And well, okay, so we, we need to match the constant. But it's going to be exactly q over 2 lambda e power to minus tau. Ah, oh, yes, good point. Now you can see it. It's going to be. So this is what I wrote the last time. OK, and of course, this is exactly the covariance function which I had. I just uh, got that sigma squared is going to be q over 2 lambda. So that's the way how if you have a stochastic diffusion equation, linear equation, so by computing the spectral density and the covariance function, you can kind of go from here to here. And now you can think that, OK, maybe you can actually go from here to here as well. And that's, that's exactly what I'm going to discuss next. But uh, before that, let's see. Well, maybe I'll, I'll reveal already. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Well, we are going to do the derivation. But anyway, so if you have this kind of Gaussian process regression problem, now we also measure something. Then in the sense that I had, we had here, uh, this is going to be equivalent to a state space model like this. And it turns out that actually this is equivalent to a kind of filtering problem or probabilistic state space model of this form. Maybe we can actually take a look at that as well. Let me switch. OK, so we use, use the Fourier transform to solve the SDE. But of course, there are plenty of other methods to solve it, right? So we had something like this. Yes? Oops. OK, so what other methods do we have? This is a linear differential equation. So there's a certain classic way which you learn to solve linear differential equation, with, which are inhomogeneous equations. Yeah. It's, it's called <laughs> integrating factor methods, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, so what we can now do is that, uh, yes, we multiply this with integrating factor. I can actually reveal that it's going to look like this. It's going to be e power to lambda t. That will be our integrating factor. And then we move uh, this. Well, we multiply. And then I already moved the first term on the right hand side to left. So it will be something like this. f is equal to w. And now, this left-hand side is, is a derivative of a product, right? And that's the trick in the integrating factor method. So what we can do is that we rewrite it like this. Oh, not that. e power to lambda t f is equal to w. And now we can integrate from t0 to t. So it will be e power to lambda t f t e power to lambda t zero f t zero is mm, well I actually forgot to so we need to recall to multiply this by the way as well lambda t so this is going to be e power to lambda s, I change the integration variable to s, like this. And now if I, if I order terms, I can actually solve my stochastic differential equation. ft is equal to 
e power to minus lambda t t zero this is t zero plus <coughs> I'm rewriting this in a more familiar form t minus t zero w s t s yes so this is a classic solution to a linear differential equation in this case this is a solution to the linear st stochastic differential equation and now it turns out that if you look at this is that uh, well this is some kind of gaussian random variable and uh, it turns out to have certain covariance q and then this is just a constant which we might call it a and um, so what this actually tells is that it tells that uh, the p of f t given f t zero whatever t zero and t r is Gaussian Let me write this more clearly. Normal distribution for ft, which is just uh, a times ft0, and then it has certain covariance q. So I can, we can uh, also compute the covariance of this one. So this is something called transition density. And it also shows that it's a Markovian process. So this A is going to be e power to minus lambda t minus t zero. The Q and Q, Q is going to be well. You can actually figure out if you use the definition of the covariance. You notice that this Q is going to be this type of. It's going to be the first term power is 2, so that's why it's 2 lambda t minus t0 <coughs> times the spectral density ds. Actually, just a moment, it's going to be s. Okay, and could you compute the integral for me? OK, so maybe it's not too difficult. You just need to match the constants <laughs> and so on, right? So it's, it's going to be q over, j no, not q over, but it's a bit hard to write. <laughs> q over 2 lambda, there will be 1 minus e power to minus 2 t minus t 0. Okay, so what I'm aiming at is that uh, actually the whole erstein ulebeck process is equivalent to this type of discrete time system, where this A is given by the matrix exponential. Then we have K, and then we have a Gaussian random variable where this has zero mean and covariance of variance Q. So the erstein ulenbeck process is, is, in this sense, equivalent to, the, to this discrete time prescription because I, I just solve the SDE at discrete time points. And, and now my point here is that actually this is a canonical Kalman filtering model. So if you write this kind of measurement model, so these are something called state-space model. This is a linear state-space model which can be <coughs> solved with a Kalman filter. Yes. So what we actually did, when I go back here, yes. So what we actually did is that uh, I was we were writing down the transition density of the process, which happened to be a Gaussian 
where there was a A times F K plus, and then there's the covariance plus Q. And then the measurement model actually has this form already. So in that sense, this is equivalent to this type of uh, very simple linear Gaussian state-based model. And of course, then this is also equivalent to simple linear Gaussian state-based model. And this is now actually solvable with a Kalman filter. Well, before going into that, I can, I can show actually how you do it, that in practice, but we can also see how you can actually generalize this a bit. So we can also, instead of, well, here we had one dimensional first order linear SDE or ODE with white noise input, but we can also have a arbitrarily high order equation with some white noise input over there. And you can then rewrite this as a vector differential equation like this. So actually, this is, a, something, this is sometimes also called erstad ulebeck process because it just corresponds to replacing this, this with the matrix and having some kind of vector, well, matrix multiplying here. So what we get is that, uh, so it turns out that this vector process is going to be Markovian because Markovian is related to the, if you have a first order differential equation with white noise input, the solution is always Markovian. So actually the F itself is not going to be Markovian, but it does not matter because the vector state is going to be Markovian. And so what's the connection? So we derived the spectral density, which we didn't write down, but anyway, so it looked something like this. So the spectral density was here. So it's constant over second order polynomial in this case. And if you repeat the same derivation for a more general differential equation of the form which I had, you notice that you will always get constant over, over polynomial in omega squared. And it turns out that uh, all processes with this type of spectral density, they are going to be Markovian. And we, we can do the Kalman filtering trick because they are Markovian. You can even have a polynomial on top of here and you, you still get that. So if we are lucky enough to have a, this form of covariance function, we can do the conversion to the other direction as well. So for example, well, if you compute the covariance or spectral density of the matter class, we're going to be quite lucky. So at least with uh, many parameter values, it has that kind of form. It's actually not a coincidence because the matter class comes from a difference equation. So that's, that's, it's, it's uh, the other direction, which is the connection. But it also turns out that, uh, well, you can use something called party approximants to form these approximations, and they work quite well. So you can, well, this is just a Taylor series, for example, for the uh, Gaussian-shaped spectral density, which corresponds to Gaussian-shaped covariance function. So you can actually do this kind of approximation with some classical Markovian approximations of non-Markovian Gaussian processes. And this is related to something called spectral factorization, which you can find in signal processing books. But anyway, so let's, uh, I'm, I'm deeply sorry that I have MATLAB in use here. I heard that it's, it's forbidden, but <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so just, uh, so we got started with, I need to maybe change the font to larger. Just a second. This is the, I don't, do, I don't know really how to use this. Preferences, yes. Editor, display. I'm not going to find it. Oh yes, there's fonts, plain. Okay, now you can maybe see. My license is expiring for it. 
Okay, so actually for the symbolic computations, uh, well, this actually uses the Maple engine. So if you have a symbolic computing device, you can actually use, you don't need to do those conversions <coughs> in, on the pen and paper, but you can just use the Fourier transform routines. And uh, also th for the transition density, I can actually form symbolic computations and even numerical computations. So I didn't need to do those in, in on pen and paper. But anyway, so more about the point is that, uh, well, let's look at this kind of process example. So this, uh, well, you can see my code, uh, generating code over here. So I have some measurements and this is, this is just a, I just wanted to order the measurements to be like in from left to right because my inference will depend on that. Okay, so how do you do that? GP regression solution. Maybe you saw this basic idea already is that, uh, yes, so this is the covariance function. This is just a lambda function or, or non-name function for the covariance function. So if, if I give, uh, let's see, okay, so I don't want to rebuild the solution yet. So I can evaluate the covariance function just by giving two values for it. And then I define KYY, KFY, KFF, and I just evaluate them. And my GP regression equations actually look like this. I hope this looks a bit familiar. So maybe it's a different notation, but you had this already. And then I can compute a couple of quantiles, for example, and then I can plot the result. So result looks basically like this. So these are the, that's the mean that uh, exponential covariance function is slightly odd choice in the sense that it's not so smooth and so on. But anyway, so this is what you get from the TB regression. And what I did is that I, I used these equations. So this is n times n. So this is this internally computed with some kind of Kolesky factorization. So it actually is n to the third. So if I add measurements very much, I will hit some kind of barrier at, at some point, maybe. Okay. Then let's see how we do the same with the Kalman buffer. So what we do is that, uh, well, we we need to start from a zero and a certain covariance function or co covariance matrix, which, well, variance in this case, which is going to be the sta stationary variance of the process. And what Kalman filter does is that the, you process the measurements one at a time. So it's prediction step, update step, prediction step, update step. So you go from the beginning to end. So these are the Kalman filter equations. These are the matrices or the parameters of the transition density which we computed. So if you recall that we had these here, so A and Q, so I have now put them already here. And then this is the comma filter update step, which we only do when we have a measurement, because we, we don't have measurement at every point that we want to predict to. And then there's plotting, and this is a stepwise thing, so let's run. So, so the comma filter starts from the left, then it produces estimates, so it's a causal kind of estimator so it means that it only knows about previous measurements right now. So that's why we have this kind of effect that we like just go blind to the first measurement, then we predict from the measurements without taking future into account. So the answer that it grows and then it go, makes <laughs> goes smaller and grows and so on. Okay, so but this is only half of the solution. But then we can use so but the point is that this is a linear operation. We have only scalar operation, which are done for each measurement, basically. So it's O n. And then we have a backwards pass. So it's something called routing Schreibel's motor, which is very similar to Kalman filter, but uh, it, it goes backwards and has a couple of different equations. So these are the ones which we evaluated. And this just uh, takes the filtering solution from our storage. These are the 
prediction equations for the smoother, this is the gain, and this is the backward update. And then the rest of that is plotting. So this is now kind of correcting the filtering solution if I run it. So it should start from the end. OK, not too much effect. But now, yes, so it's conditioning all the estimates to all of the data. So this is the backward pass, which is again a linear operation. And now my claim is that uh, this solution is exactly the same as with uh, Gaussian process regression, but with linear computational complexity instead of the quadratic. And uh, so let's see. Well, they look quite similar indeed, so the solution should be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, and you can, we can also more formally com compare the means and, and variances, so they, they match quite closely, yes. So provided that I have coded my <laughs> code right, so it, it should be correct. So in this case, you can actually solve the same GP regression problem using that kind of forward pass and backward pass. And that's, that's something called Kalman filter and RDS motor. But still, so we only can do it if we can uh, find a Markovian representation, vector Markovian representation <laughs> for the GP. What are the constraints on that? Uh, the, the constraint is basically, well, of course, in this form, this is only for temporal case. And you need to have a rational form of spectral entity. It's a bit non-intuitive to think about processes with have non-rational spectral entity. They're kind of finally differentiable type of processes. So actually, you cannot do that exactly for that uh, Gaussian-shaped RBF covariance function, but you can do it for matter classes quite. OK, so we were actually doing, well, this was my first and Ulebeck case. But yes, you can also do that for vector processes. The column filter itself looks the same, but of course the conversion procedure looks different in that case. Yes, so the basic idea is that, uh, well, the state space methods, so if you can actually do this kind of approximation, then you will, will get the stochastic differential equation, or linear stochastic differential equation, which is compatible with common filters and smoothers. But you can also do that for a space-time case. So it's uh, mathematically more complicated, but anyway, so you can kind of convert the temporal part into differential equation, and then we, you will have a x dependence here. So it's instead of having one-dimensional state, as I had in my orstein ulenbeck case, or, say, pen-dimensional state, as I had in my, or would have in my more higher-order Markov case, we will have an infinite-dimensional state. So it's a function going forwards in, in time. But you can still use common filter kind of methods to actually solve that problem. And you can also use parallelization methods sometimes. But anyway, so that's, that's a different thing. I'm not going to discuss that too much. OK, but so you already saw the orstein ulenbeck case, which is actually a special case of Matern already. And for Matern class, for example, for second order case, so you will have a vector SDE or stochastic differential equation. Uh, OK, so my notation is, by the way, now, you can, in your mind, you can divide by dt to get a different equation. Sorry, this is the notation which you see in stochastics always. But anyway, it's two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional in this case. And if I have five or, or two, it would be third-order, I mean, I mean three-dimensional equation or state. Yes, and uh, this is actually an example of the sp spatiotemporal case. So it's still kind of two-dimensional, but the catch is that it's going to be a function of, uh, of some continuous variable. So it's actually infinite dimensional, like a infinite times two-dimensional, if you could say. And uh, this matrix is not just a matrix, but the operator. So this is a Laplacian or second derivative operator here. And then we have a, like a B 
bit trickier operator. This is not an ordinary squ square root. It's an operator square root. But anyway, so it's a, some kind of linear operator acting on, on the function in x variable here. But in, anyway, this is, a, this is Markovia in time. So you have a certain set of up, uh, algorithms that can be used to do inference in this while using the Markovian, Markovian property. OK. What was the differential equation that corresponds to the Markovian case? So did you, did you write that down on the previous slide? Was that a mishap? Uh, yes, it's this one. OK, sorry. And this would be the space time case. This is a slightly odd process if you think about OK, it, it's a jointly matter in space and time. It's non physical process. Okay, but let's then take a look at uh, some connections to stochastic party adversary equations, which is, I'm not going to derive, or we are not going to be deriving any, anymore anything, so don't, don't worry about that. But anyway, so this is actually the classic matter connection. So if we consider this kind of stochastic party adversary equation, where we have a second derivative in x, second derivative in y, and then constant times the f is equal to white noise in space and time, I mean in space. Then uh, actually using the same method, so we take the Fourier transform, and then we compute the expectation of the square of the absolute value, we can actually derive the spectral density. And it will turn out to have this kind of form. So it's, it's 1 over the thing squared times awful constants, but I, I just didn't write them down. down. Anyway, they only depend on the properties of, of the spectral density of the white noise and then that lambda. And yes, the connection to matter is that if you take the inverse Fourier transform, which is, by the way, quite a tedious operation, you will get the matter covariance function. And uh, actually, the whole, whole matter class can be obtained by, was it so that uh, you need to have fractional operators there? And then you take this transform, and you will get the full class of matter and covariance functions. Yes. So this is the matter and covariance function. So it already corresponds to this kind of party adversary equation. And indeed, if you have only one variable, you can think of it as, a, as time. And then you have the same kind of results which we had in the previous slides. Yes, so more generally, if we think about party adversary equations, we indeed have some kind of uh, operator times f is equal to white noise, as we had here. So this operator is second derivatives minus lambda squared. And uh, now we can think so, well, if you have this operator, if you forget that it's an operator and just replace in your mind that with, with the matrix, then you can figure out the uh, covariance operators or covariance functions, how you correspond to this. So if you solve for kind of the covariance will be this kind of expression where this is adjoint, which is a uh, transpose in operators. And uh, uh, precision matrix or operator will look like this. And now the idea in these PD and OD methods, except for the state space approach, is that uh, well, when you use finite differences or finite element methods, you will get sparse precision approximation. That's because you are approximating this operator with sparse approximations. Well, for example, if we go back here, if you use finite difference approximations of this, you might recall what they look like. So you have a matrix with some band, a couple of bands there. So it means that, that that matrix is very sparse. So it means that this is approximated as sparse matrix times f is equal to white noise. So this is going to be very sparse. So it means that this is going to be sparse, right? Because sparse times sparse is almost as sparse in this case. It's, it's not in general. True, but anyway, so these are going to be that kind of bad diagonal matrices. Yes. So then you can use numerical methods which 
which take uh, advantage of the sparseness of the precision matrix or precision operator. And uh, in the Fourier case, it's more complicated connection, but anyway, so it leads to reduced rank covariance approximations. So it's, this is going to be somehow reduced rank or you not know, sparse, but anyway, so you can use methods which use take advantage of that. And already we saw that uh, if we only have one variable here, then we can use that spectral factorization trick to get Markovian things and that we get the common for the case from that. There are some deep connections between these ideas, but anyway, it's not so clear how it goes. Yes, so the final differences look something like this. So this is indeed the approximation. So it corresponds to, uh, so that L is very sparsely approximated. And indeed, you can see that you get this kind of property. And so the catch is that you need to have this, needs to be some kind of uh, like a classical operator so that this becomes sparse. But okay, so you can also have less classical operators. For example, if you try to factor the, or find the operator for the RBF covariance function, it's not going to be integral differential operator. By the way, integral differential operators are the ones which have rational spectra. So it's, everything is connected, connected to rational spectra here as well. But yes, yeah, so this is a grid-based approximation, but except for the frame. But anyway, so this can be parallelized quite nicely. And then you could have Fourier methods, which are also used for GPs. So you basically have something like this in the approximation for the covariance function. And if you happen to have a uniformly sampled case, you can even use like a fast Fourier transform to compute the solutions. And but the classic way is to just truncate the series, or you can even use random frequencies with one approach. Yes, but it's, it's quite already known methods in GP regression as well. well then you can use some other, uh, other, uh, other basis function approximations, for example, those like a basal function kind of things or uh, operate uh, or the eigenfunctions of an, this kind of operator, which is some kind of generalization of Fourier basis. And the idea is to use the radius trunk approximation by using less coefficients than the number of data points. So this is some kind of, uh, you actually approximate the, the non-parametric GP as a parametric model with finite number of parameters. So what is, that's what hap what's happening here. But anyway, the approximation looks still the same. But you can use something like wavelets or, well, the color key approximation is more general term for this type of expansions and fin finite elements can also be seen as this kind of approximations. And maybe inducing point methods are actually in this class as well if you want to interpre interpret them as such. Yes, so conclusion. So we can go back to the table. So in spatial case, that's what we went a bit, a bit faster. Anyways, you will get an SPD model, so this might be a Laplacian operator, meaning second derivative plus something, and then this is a white noise field. So for example, Matern has been, or was originally derived from this kind of SPDE, stochastic part of the equation. But in temporal case, when we have only one input variable, so we get this kind of linear stochastic differential equations, and then, for example, for the Erst and Uhlenbeck case, we could use the Kalman filter and smoother to actually solve it in, in linear time. And uh, then in spatial temporal case, we didn't go too deeply into that, but you get similar kind of results, but you need to use sp space time Kalman filtering methods, which have their own problems, by the way. But anyway, so in principle, you can map this covariance function into these kind of equations. Yes, so what else? Well, because we know that uh, there's a link between these two areas like PDEs and GPs, because we can exchange approximations or try to find the corresponding ones and find the holes 
in result sense of what's missing still there. So inducing point methods might be, I don't know, I think they are related to point collocation. Spectral methods, well, they are color key methods also in both areas. Finite differences, well, they are actually used in space, sp spatial statistics. They are like a discrete random field approximations. But yes, so when we had differential equations, we only had linear differential equations right now. But of course, well, I can just put nonlinearity in the equation just easily, or even some other kinds of uh, inputs than Gaussian white noise. So I can put Levy processes or Poisson processes inside the equations, and everything makes sense. Please. I guess yes. There's no reason why not. Could you try something in that direction? You mean like uh, well, the, the complex values are just a very linear combination of two. Like, can you go to the last one? So let's say the last question. If you have an i in front of the zero. Yes. Uh, anyway, complex equations are kind of uh, equivalent to real equations. So you can like a uh, First, have the real value and complex value equation, and then you combine in the end. Okay. That's one way of seeing that. So at least that way it's possible, I guess. But of course, maybe complex valued equations as well. I have seen something related to that. So I know how to formulate it, but so I would say yes. <laughs> it's hard. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, well, there's also some research on, well, you always make deep things of everything. So you can also think about like uh, stacking these SPD models. So in one input, you have another SPD. So you could call it hierarchical or deep model or whatever. And uh, so the SPD becomes non-leader, which is a slight challenge because non-leader PDs are quite op awful creatures. and. Stochastic ones are even more awful, but anyway, so in principle, you can do that. And then, uh, well, nice thing is that, uh, well, there's something called latent force models. Did we have, Mauricio, any talks here on latent force models? No. So the basic idea is that if you have some kind of physical system and you have some unknown part there, so you can model that unknown part using a GP. And then we have a, for example, differential equation stack with a GP. So the nice thing is that if you actually convert the GP into differential equation, you just have one differential equation instead of two different parts. So that's quite nice in numerical sense sometimes. And because we have the means to go to nonlinear case, we can also go to nonlinear and non-negotian latent force models. And uh, one thing which is related, so you can actually, well, there's something called inverse problems. So you don't need to measure the GP directly, but you might have some physical system between. So it's, it's related to these kind of systems. So you can, that, those are more natural to formulate. But anyway, as a summary, so Gaussian processes are nice, but uh, they scale quite badly when you use the basic equations, because it's cubic complexity. And uh, there are indeed uh, good methods to cope with that. But anyway, I was discussing one way, which is to use the representations as solutions to stochastic party artificial equations. So the especially useful case are the temporal models, where we, we can use those comma filters and basin filters and smoothers to solve the GP regression problem in linear time. So it's a very small subset of all models, but anyway, when you can do that, it's very useful. And also other stochastic party division equation methods can be used to speed up GP inference using those sparse methods and related. And uh, so there are also different kind of paths towards nonlinear or non-Gaussian non -Gaussian models. Of course, you can also replace GPs with student T processes, but this is a different way because you can form nonlinear SDEs and SPDEs. And these also work nicely with in latent force models. And some references. 
The first part is provocative because actually much of the classical Gaussian process work is by Norbert Wiener. And there's a nice book from 1950. So the spectral factorizations and everything can be found in that book. And then there's a Stratovich work where I like the idea of uh, approximating Gaussian processes as Markov processes. So actually the Taylor series approximation is from that book. And uh, then we were using those results basically in a couple of articles. And actually there's Arno's thesis is nice as well. I didn't recall to list it. And uh, this is my book on the filtering case. And then this will, be, will appear hopefully this year. So it has a chapter about this stochastic diversal equation connections with GPs. I guess this is my last slide. Yes. OK, but uh, feel free to ask questions. Yes. So in the case of, of these partial integers, these SPDE solvers, um, how do the boundary conditions affect the regression? Well, they define what the solution will be. <laughs> so, yeah. so how do you set them up? You need to somehow, well, typically, I guess you need to approximate using some finite set. So it, it depends. So, well, if, if you can assume that your process is zero at the boundary, then you get to direct land, but you can also use some others. There's no one way. There's no one way. Yes? Uh, could you? So can it lead to local optimum yes. in the high? Well, actually, so it has the same kind of problems as uh, as estimating parameters in GP models in general, because it, it's kind of uh, it's it's equivalent up to an approximation, and you have certainly the same non-convexity problem as with other GP. Uh, parameter estimation methods. Well, so as long as you stay within Gaussian processes, you have unique solution for the process itself. But of course, for the parameters, you will get all kinds of problems if you use more complicated models. Did that answer so, part of the question? Uh, if uh, we work with uh, more complex thermal type like, uh, could that optimize a lot of uh, type of thermal like, uh, linear or square kernels or product of linear square kernels? Yes, so actually there are. So provided that, so the question was, can you use this kind of thing for product kernels and uh, sums of kernels. So if you can express each of those kernels in an SPDE or especially an SDE form, yes, you can, you can also form the products and sums. So actually, it's Arno Sulin's thesis has many of those tricks already listed there. So, so in high dimensional case, well, so, so the color filtering thing is well, we have been using that for space time. Okay, so in that sense, the space is infinite dimensional in the sense. But if you're asking about high input dimensions, yeah, yeah so that that's one uh, disadvantage, at least, uh, at least our current methods. So they are quite much restricted to small dimensionalities in the inputs. That's because we need to use these uh, series expansion methods, which don't scale, scale very well with the number of input dimensions. So yes, I, I think it would be possible to actually develop methods which work better in higher dimensional input spaces. So that would be a good, good thing to work on.
Okay, great. So thank you.